Paul, the Holy Spirit and the Ephesians. This is part nine and we're talking about the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. Our scriptural foundation for this part of the series is based on the objective in the book of Ephesians, which of course begins by Paul saying he wants them to have grace and peace and the fullness of the blessing of God in Jesus in heavenly realms. Ephesians near the end says this, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Now, he said this is a great mystery, but he's talking about the church as the bride of Christ. Part of the objective here in Paul's writing is to give them teaching that doesn't change. It's eternal. It's significant. It's put in writing and it's to help them get to this place of being the glorious church. Remember, he'd already evangelized the church, he'd done discipleship, they'd done spiritual warfare, he'd delegated, set up pastoral structure, warned them about wolves coming in, and then he knew they needed something to finish them off, to get to be this glorious church. So he put it in writing. And in the writing he has teaching, and he has instructions, but he also has a prayer for wisdom and revelation that the eyes of their understanding might be enlightened. These things are essential for us. We have the teaching. It's written here in the eternal word of God, which is exactly what they had. And we have the prayer that we can pray. So let's pray this prayer today to make sure we are receiving from God exactly what we need to move on to maturity, to our future, and to our destiny, being the bride of Christ, that spotless, holy, and pure. And in the process, being able to demonstrate to the principalities and powers the wisdom of God, which is demonstrated through the church in Jesus' name. Plus, we'll be able to walk in all the spiritual blessings that are reserved in heaven and in the heavenly places for us and to walk in the fullness of our inheritance as we were learning last week. So let's pray. Father, today we're asking that you would give us your spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened, that we might know the hope of your calling and the exceeding greatness of your glorious inheritance for us who believe, and also the exceeding greatness of your mighty power, which you wrought in Christ when you raised him from the dead and seated him in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that's named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come. And Father, I pray for a supernatural revelation for each one of us to realize that we were raised up with Jesus at the day of resurrection once we believe in him baptized to put off the old, put on the new. And Father, we're asking for your help to see the renewing of our mind through your revelation today. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, today's section is about this exceeding great power that was made available to us. Now, to help us with this, we remember that Paul's prayer prayed for three things. He prayed that we might know the hope of his calling, that we might know the riches of the glory of his inheritance. And the third point is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe. Last week, we looked at this glorious inheritance. And today we're looking at the power that's available to us, the greater one inside us. Amen. First, I'm going to read this from the Passion Translation, this section of the prayer, and this is found in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 to 23. I pray that you'll continually experience the immeasurable greatness of God's power made available to you through faith. That's such a key statement. That's why I read this version. Then your life will be an advertisement of this immense power as it works through you. This is the mighty power that was released when God raised Christ from the dead and exalted him to the place of highest honor and supreme authority 
in the heavenly realm. And now he is exalted as the first above every ruler, authority, government, and realm of power and existence. He is gloriously enthroned over every name that is ever praised, not only in this age, but in the age that is to come. And he alone is the leader and source of everything needed in the church. God has put everything beneath the authority of Jesus Christ and has given him the highest rank above all others. And now we, his church, are his body on earth and that which fills him who is being filled by it. Okay, so that's the Passion Translation. Now I'm going to read this again in the New King James Version and let's really focus on what the objective of this prayer is. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you might know what is the hope of his calling? That's the first one. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in, or we could say, for the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working? Now, this according to is like saying it's equated with. And I want to put it to you today that this is exactly the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that's named, not only in this age, but in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Think about this. When God raised Jesus from the dead, the impact of this really comes home when we realize that when he died on the cross, we were crucified with him. He took us, the sinful old nature, into himself, was crucified on the cross, dead and buried for three days. But on the third day, because the shedding of his innocent blood was sufficient, far more than sufficient, to counter every sin that's ever been committed, then God was able to raise him from the dead, the scales of justice having been completely fulfilled forever. And when Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of God, we were raised together with him. And you'll see this in Ephesians chapter 2 where it says, we were raised up together and made to sit together in the heavenly places at the right hand of God. Now let's read this again. He was raised up and we've been raised up with him, seated with him at the right hand of God in heavenly places, far above. This is you and me in Christ, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that's named, not only in this age, but in that which is to come. So there's nobody or nothing that's higher than Jesus and there never will be. Whether it's now or in the age to come, it's always going to be Jesus at the highest place and the position at God's right hand. And he has amazingly made it possible for us to be seated with him in that place. Now, there's conditions on this. We have to be born again. You have to actually believe, confess Jesus is Lord, walk in the Spirit, live by faith, be a worshipper in spirit and in truth. Obviously, that leads to a holy life. When we are fully in Christ, led by the Spirit, remember it says those that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God, then we are in this position at God's right hand, the place of highest authority, and also released in us then is the same power that raised Jesus there because he raised us there at the same time. Amen. This is awesome. Let's read some of it now in the Good News Translation. This power working in us 
is the same as the mighty strength which he used when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right side in the heavenly world. The power working in us is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and us with him. This power is victorious over all sin, sickness, the curse, poverty, fear, anxiety, anything that steals your peace and anything that would try to addict you to sin, this power that raised Jesus, it's already happened and it's greater inside us than he that's in the world. Amen. This is the power that made the resurrection come to pass with us in him. Power to lift us with him to the place of highest status, authority, position, prominence, power, whatever. It's already happened. Nothing was able to stop it on the day of resurrection. Nothing will ever be able to change it. The power in us is infinite. And his authority and our authority in him is absolute authority. You know, some people say there are no absolutes to which we should always respond. Are you absolutely sure about that? Because if you're not, then there are absolutes. Amen. And if you are absolutely sure there's no absolutes, you just contradicted yourself. So there are absolutes and Jesus has absolutely all authority and the power that raised him from the dead is infinite. It's the same power that brought all the universe into existence. It's the power that put the stars in place. Amen. This is the power that God has invested in us. And Ephesians 3.20 says, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, far above all that we could ever ask, think or imagine according to the power that's at work in us. That power is in you. The power is in me. And that power is invested in us by God and the authority of Jesus, which we can put into practice in the name of Jesus, can release that power to do anything. That's why Jesus said, all things are possible to him that believes. With God, nothing shall be impossible because the power that's in you and me is infinite power. And it's proven to be that. And it's proven to be far above the devil because the devil could not stop it. Amen. This power is available to us through faith. And we also know that Paul prayed this prayer so that they would have revelation of this power so they could walk in it. Amen. Last week, we looked at that scripture that said, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those that love him, but God has revealed them to us by his spirit. It's the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now, for background today, we see that as Paul was pioneering this church and getting it started, they'd already had a good encounter of the enemy and his work. This first appeared as opposition and resistance when Paul started preaching in the synagogue right at the beginning that some of them became stubborn, rejecting his message, and publicly speaking against the way. So that was the first of the enemy's counterattacks. The second one was when they had the riot and the persecution. This is Acts 19, 23 to 34. And about that time, there arose a great commotion about the way. A little bit further down, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theatre. With one accord, some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and most of them did not know why they had come together. And then they tried to get Alexander or whatever. When they found out he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out for about two hours, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So that riot and that persecution against Jews and Christians was the second level of this enemy attack. And then there was a third level, you could say, when Paul warned the Ephesian elders. We read about this in Acts chapter 20, verses 29 to 31. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up, 
speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So they had seen the work of the devil. Added to that is this need for the devil and all the principalities and powers to be shown God's wisdom through the church. And what I'm leading up to here is that these Ephesian believers from this teaching need to elevate their thinking to the point of realizing that they've got to encounter, overcome and speak lessons and do physical and outward demonstrations to the devil of God. Listen to this, Ephesians 3.10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. So there are a lot of reasons here for these people to know the reality by revelation of the power that's in them. Of course, later on in the book of Ephesians in chapter 6, Paul tells them it's not against flesh and blood that we wrestle, but against principalities and powers, etc. And we'll come to that. So today, the part we're looking at is revelation of the exceeding greatness of his power. Amen. So what can we learn from what Paul wrote to the Ephesians about the exceeding greatness of his power? Number one today, God has already released all the power we will ever need through the resurrection of Jesus. Eh? God's power raised Jesus from the dead. Ephesians 1, 11 to 23, the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Amen. B, the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, raised Jesus from the dead. Romans 1, 4, declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Also, Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. So it's God the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Interestingly, the Bible also says that the glory of the Father raised Christ from the dead. Romans 6, 4, Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. So we can see it, the Spirit of God, the power of God, the glory of God raised Jesus from the dead. Arguably, those three things are describing the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. His power is in manifestation, God's glory was in manifestation, and the Spirit of God was in manifestation. And that's the power that's in you today. D. Jesus has all authority and the highest name. Just going into a couple of other epistles now, and in Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 to 11, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. I said, Jesus has all authority and the highest name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, those in earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hebrews 1.4, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Matthew 28.18, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven, and on earth, and Revelations 19, 15 to 16. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So you can see Jesus has all authority given to him. The power to do all this was released at the resurrection of Jesus. Now think about this. The devil and all his ability was absolutely no match 
for the power we're talking about today. Otherwise, he could have kept him down. You know, this is amazing. Now the devil is under Jesus' feet. We are in Christ. We are members of his body. So the devil is under our feet. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give you. It's not something we've earned or deserved. It's given by Jesus the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, I know there are people saying, well, that didn't work for me. That's not true. But you've got to remember the word of God is not describing the way things are. The word of God changes things. It's spiritual food, not a description of the enemy's achievements. In other words, at the beginning of the Bible, it says the earth was without form and void. And God didn't say, man, the earth's without form and void. He didn't describe what it was. He spoke to change what was being experienced. He said, let there be light. And there was light. That's how they got rid of the darkness. Amen. Now, behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. If what you're experiencing is not this, then I want to encourage you to feed this into your innermost being. Feed it in. Renew your mind with it. Put off the old. Put on the new. Pray for revelation of this until this truth dominates the circumstances. That's what the word of God is given for. Amen. E, Jesus' death and resurrection destroyed the devil's power. Hebrews 2, 8 to 9, then 14. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. Now, this is since he raised from the dead. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. Now, in this, the writer of Hebrews, which of course is the Holy Spirit, is showing us this principle of now and not yet. Now, Jesus has all authority, and yet we don't see that authority dominating in all parts of the earth yet. Now it's reality. Now it's given by God but there's an outworking of it. Amen. I always remember that Iraq war where the Allied forces bombed it and brought it under submission, but they had to send the ground troops in for a long time to bring to pass the reality of what had taken place in the authority of who had control in that country. Amen. So Jesus won all of this authority and position and power for us, and it's now our job on earth to operate in that authority and power to enforce Jesus' kingdom and to force the kingdom of darkness back until it shrinks away to nothing. Amen. So let's read it from that perspective. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. In other words, Jesus' authority is absolute and universal. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. That makes me want to laugh because the Bible says if the principalities and powers had have understood God's plan, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. They thought they were doing the smartest thing since sliced bread, but they were out of the frying pan into the fire. They fell into their own trap. They set a trap for themselves. That's why Psalm 2 says, he who sits in the heaven shall laugh. He'll have them in derision because they're not as smart as they think they are. They played their whole deck of cards in one hand on Jesus dying. They thought they'd removed him, but their plan failed 
because not only did Jesus die there, and they thought never to be seen again, all of us died there as well, but the power of God through the innocent blood of Jesus that the devil spilled was enough to balance the scales of justice. God raised him from the dead and all of us, now we're all in a position above the devil and we've got to get out there now and enforce the devil under our feet where he needs to be. Amen. One day we were playing a concert at the Croxton Park Hotel, just north of Melbourne. And at the end of the night, we had packed up the truck and the thing wouldn't start. And I had one other guy with me by then and everyone else seemed to have gone. And we had to get it started. And so I said to him, right, we're going to do a roll start. But there was no hill. So I put him in the driver's seat and I said, I'm going to push it. <laughs> and I had to push tons and tons of truck and equipment. I had to push it to get it moving. And then eventually he did a roll start with it and got it going and I was able to drive it home. That was not easy. And I often think about that. Push starting a truck is one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Thank God I was young in those days and muscular. But once I got it started, it had the power to drag that equipment all around the place. Been up and down to Brisbane and Sydney and Canberra and over to Griffith and all around the place. It could pull that equipment, no trouble. But getting it started was hard. Once it got started, it had power. And that's a bit like this. Jesus is in that tomb and all of us with him. And then he has to stay there for three days. But once the power of God hit him, there was nothing the devil could do. The power that hit him was infinitely, exceedingly abundant. Exceedingly. That's why it uses that word, because his power exceeds the devil's power. And all of us were raised up and we were given that same power to operate through us. And there's nothing that the devil has that's any match for the power of God. That's why Paul's writing to them with such motivation that they would learn how to operate in this power. It takes faith and it takes revelation. The faith comes by hearing. That's why there's a book of teaching. And the revelation comes by praying and a living a holy life, submitting to God and all of that. And then when you put the two of them together, the teaching, the revelation, faith comes, faith and revelation. Then if you can see it, you can have it. Amen. So what have we learned so far from what Paul wrote to the Ephesians about the exceeding greatness of his power to us? Number one, God has already released all the power we will ever need in the resurrection of Jesus. So number five today, and really this is a kind of conclusion, make sure you are born again and Jesus is your Lord. Now, when Jesus did all that death, burial and resurrection, being raised up by the power of God, dealing with the old nature, recreating a new nature. He did all the hard yards. And now we can enter this process through a simple prayer. And if you haven't even got time to pray, it's through confessing Jesus is Lord and receiving him as your saviour and taking him on as your good shepherd. But today we'll do it through prayer. And it's based on these scriptures. In John chapter 3, verses 3 to 7, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So he can't get revelation unless you're born again. You cannot enter the kingdom of God. So you can't be in God's family or access all this power unless you're born again. That's why Jesus said in verse 7, you must be born again. Now, being born again or receiving the new birth can happen for you today. And in a moment, we'll lead in a prayer for being born again. Now, Acts chapter 2, 21, it says this, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So we need to call on the name of Jesus. And Romans 10, 9, 10 specifies some of this. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So right now I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I've got to ask you this question. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you and as you? And that when he died, he was dying for your sin? 
Do you believe that when he rose from the dead, your sin was annihilated, your old life was gone, and that because of that, there is a basis for forgiveness and for you to be born again? You must believe that Jesus raised from the dead. Now, if you're ready for this, ready to be born again and to come into this place of revelation and operating in God's power in Jesus' name, then simply say the prayer I'm about to lead you in. Say it to God, mean it with all of your heart, and then receive what he has for you today, which is called the new birth. You might still look pretty much the same on the outside, but something changes inside. So say this after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe Jesus died on the cross for me. I believe he paid for everything I've done wrong. I believe he rose for my justification. Today, in Jesus' name, I receive Jesus as my Saviour. I confess Jesus is my Lord. I will follow him as my Good Shepherd. I receive the new birth right now. I'm born again by the Spirit of God. My name is in the Lamb's Book of Life and I am filled with God's Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you said that prayer, I believe you've just been born again and right now you can get excited and remember to tell someone about this. Of course, Keep reading the Word of God. If you don't have a Bible, you can download the Bible app for your phone or for your computer, or you can download an audio Bible so that you can listen to it. And remember to keep watching our presentations. I'm sure if you follow the links at the end of this message, you'll find links to many other messages and you can keep going and keep learning. And today, in the name of Jesus, I declare that you're born again. And all of us who are born again today, I thank you, Lord, that you've given us that prayer for wisdom and revelation that we can walk in all the fullness of what you've died to provide and all of the blessings in the power, the anointing and the authority of Jesus. Amen. Well, God bless you today. Thanks a lot for listening. I look forward to seeing you in the next message. Remember to subscribe, like and share this message.